All right, welcome back to Racial and Ethnic Minorities. Um, this week is the week of October 25th. So in this week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, <clears throat> it's October 25th, 27th, and 29th. The most important thing about this week is that you have an exam this Friday. So I want to start off by going over the exam in detail. To be honest with you, it's just like the last one, but just to be sure, you know how it goes. I'm going to go over it in detail just like I did the last one so that you understand how it will be um, presented to you. So uh, first thing, uh, next slide, your exam two will be available Friday, October 29th at midnight. So October 28th, 11.59, when the clock strikes midnight, October 29th at midnight, your exam will be available to you, okay? Um, you will have 24 hours to complete the exam. Uh, so it will be due at 11.59 p.m. that night, that Friday night, October 29th. There will be 30 to 40 questions on the exam. Okay. Um, so again, same as before. Uh, the questions will be available under the assignments tab on the link that says exam two. So let's say exam two questions. Same thing, just like before, you can download the questions and answer them on the document, save your document with the answers and upload them before the deadline. Um, or you can download the questions, record number, the number to the questions and answers on a separate document and upload your answers before the deadline. So you can either download the actual document, record it on there, or you can do a whole different document that has 1A, 2B, 3C, 4D, whatever. Okay. You will submit your answers under the assignments tab that says exam two in Canvas before the deadline. Okay, so you, you download it, the assignments tab on the link that says exam two, and then you submit it there. Um, Please be sure to type the correct answer next to the correct number. If you do not, it can throw off your entire exam. This can cause the rest of the answers to be wrong. So I've seen sometimes where students may want question 24, uh, look at question 24 and mark it for 25 and so on. And then they end up getting thrown off. So if there's 40 questions on the exam, you only have 39 answers. Now you gotta go back and figure out why do I only have 39 answers? Okay, or 41 answers and there's 40 questions on the exam and you did some wrong. <clears throat> so please be careful. Upload the document with your answers in Word or PDF format. Make sure you are using Word or PDF. Some students are not. <clears throat> That's very important. With their assignments, some students still uploading in other formats. I can't read them, you get a zero. You don't wanna get a zero on your exam. Word or PDF. If you upload them in a format I cannot download, you, you will not receive a grade for your exam, which can severely hurt your grade in the class, okay? Sometimes I might get any of the following responses. My device stopped working, Professor Grant. My Canvas wasn't working. It wouldn't let me upload. I don't have Wi-Fi. Can I email you a screenshot of it not working? Prepare. Preparation, preparation, preparation. Make sure you are on the device where you can download and upload the exam. I would not take the exam on this phone, if on your phone, if I were you. Make sure you are somewhere where you have Wi-Fi. Um, don't, oh, I think I might have Wi-Fi at my friend's house and you get there and it's time to take the exam and your friend say, oh yeah, my Wi-Fi is down. Go somewhere where you know you have Wi-Fi. Late in our email submissions will result in significant point deduction. Lots of points. Then after an hour, you won't be able to submit it at all. So I highly recommend, highly recommend 
that you submitted on time. Okay. Um, so some of my suggestions, definitely submit the exam early. Don't wait till the last minute. I saw in some exams where some students submitted it right at 1159. I was like, okay, that's what you want to do. And it went through, but I've seen it where sometimes it doesn't. So it's up to you if you want to do that and, and take that risk. Complete the exam in the library next to a computer with, with your laptop, just in case you can't upload it on your laptop. Then you can email it to yourself. Um, and you upload it on the library computer. If, uh, if that doesn't work, you can upload it on your phone and your device. So you have three different devices. You got your laptop, you got your school computer, and you got your phone. Email it to yourself, and then that way you can upload it any way you would like. If you're still having trouble, make sure you save the document, restart your device, and then upload the document. Sometimes you have to do that. And those things happen. At the worst times, you end up having to update or restart. So that's why you shouldn't wait to the last minute. Give yourself time. Okay, don't start the exam at 11. Try to finish at 11.59, and then your laptop says, oh, I got to reboot. What? I wouldn't do that if I were you. Give yourself time to do, to, to uh, restart your device. So don't do it one minute before the deadline. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. If you have any questions about the topics or the exam or what to expect, reach out to me. All right. With that being said, since you do have an exam this week, I'm not going to give you an assignment, but this um, lecture is testable. So information from this lecture will likely be on the exam. <clears throat> All right. So let's go to the next slide. So um, Asian Americans, if we look at this uh, collage, we see that Asian Americans and people who identify as Asian Americans comes in many different uh, ways, right? Many different ways, many different looks. Um, they're uh, people who are considered Asian or Asian American um, oftentimes come from many different countries, right? So it's a big racial group that we are talking about. Uh, this notion of the myth of the model minority and um, very interesting. And although they come from different walks of life, different countries, uh, different ethnicities, and oftentimes have different interests, um, there are some things that Asian Americans oftentimes have to deal with uh, when it comes to race, particularly race within the US context. Um, so before we go straight into the topic, I want to, uh, I really like this quote. I think this quote does a really good job of setting us up for this discussion, this conversation. When people rely on surface appearances and false racial stereotypes rather than in-depth knowledge of others at the level of the heart, mind, and spirit, their ability to assess and understand people accurately is compromised. Okay, So it's very important that when we do an analysis of people, it's important that as much as we can try to get to the heart, the mind, and the spirit of anybody who we come in contact with using surface level appearances, using, using racial stereotypes, um, gives us an inaccurate view of who people really are, okay? Um, so this notion of the model minority, this model minority myth, uh, again, really came about during the civil rights movement, I know we talk about this movement a lot, but this was kind of uh, a time when notions around identity, identity construction, politics of identity really started to take shape. And oftentimes we think about it in terms of black and white, right? Civil rights movement, black leaders, Martin Luther King, blah, 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 blah. John F. Kennedy, blah, 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 right? 
Think about that. Oftentimes we don't talk about other racial groups that are now benefiting from the civil rights policies, but are also subject to the racism and mistreatment of people based on race. See, first, when we talk about race in the US context, largely we talk about black and white because those are the major racial groups in the country for, for a good chunk of time. But as we move into the 20th century and as the 20th century begins to emerge and change, and as the demographics of the, of the country begin to emerge and change, we start to see that the United States is becoming much more of a melting pot. Some people say it's not really a melting pot as much as it's a fondue. <laughs> um, maybe like a, a cake where you have layers, but they don't really melt necessarily. Um, actually a fondue more kind of melts maybe. But uh, because there's still hierarchies, right? But there are other cultures and racial groups that are represented. So even when you look at this, uh, the 1960s, and obviously the, 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 the narrative of the civil rights movement is what a lot of times dominates that decade, you also have other movements that were very important during that time. Whether you're talking about the Chicano movement, whether you're talking about Cesar Chavez, whether you're talking about the gay and liberation movement, whether you're talking about the women's rights movement that was in during that time, but also transition probably made more of a, of a, of a stop during the 1970s, you know, when we really start to see the women's rights movement really start to, 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 take, to take shape, but it comes out of the inspiration from civil rights movements and the marches, et cetera. So there are other groups that are now starting to join forces, support and demand equality on a racial level, and it's not just black folks, right? Now, there are many Asian people who have now uh, come to the United States um, and are looking to make the United States their home. Now, Asian immigration dates all the way back to the latter part of the 19th century with the Opium Wars and the ways in which Europe, particularly Great Britain, underdeveloped China purposely because China would not trade with them. Um, China chose to keep themselves kind of away from the rest of the world, kind of be a world of its own. And so drugs were then forced upon those people. And it absolutely destay, I, I guess underdeveloped is a strong word, but destabilized their societies for a while. That in addition to um, the gold rush, that happened, I think it was in 1849, uh, the gold rush that brought a lot of Asian immigrants to the States, the gold rush that happened in the, um, uh, in, the 18, in the 1840s, where in California, also brought a lot of Asians to, um, to the United States. And then over time, and then particularly when more and more uh, when, when the United States began to get involved in diplomacy in Asian countries, you have, obviously you have the uh, beef between the United States and Japan uh, with the bombing of Pearl Harbor, entering a World War II, dropping the bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. All right. Shortly after that, but that's the end of world. That's the end of World War II, at least the United States part in it, um, and brings about the end of it as a whole. Shortly after that, you have the Korean War because people want to stop the spread of communism. Shortly after that, you have the um, you got the Vietnam War, again saying that the idea is to stop the spread of communism. There's a lot of pushback there, um, and so you have now the United States very much involved with foreign diplomacy, foreign policies. They now have a, a, a distinct interest in Asian countries. So now you have more and more US soldiers going into Japan and China and Vietnam, right? 
And so with that, more and more Asian people are also coming back to the United States. Some of them may be coming back as wives of soldiers, mothers of children of soldiers. There was a lot of that happening if you read the myth of the model minority. It was either in that one or Asian, I sometimes I get it mixed up, or Asian American sexual politics. I think it was Asian American sexual politics. Um, but we read that earlier as well. So if you remember, it was there. A lot of, of interracial relationships happening during that time between the US soldiers and Asian women. And then also the United States borders began to open up. So more and more Asians began to come into the country. So by the time you get to the 1960s, um, the United States has a pretty sizable Asian population. Whether you're talking about, again, Vietnamese, Chinese, Japanese, Filipino. So as they are coming into this country, they are also trying to navigate this idea of race. The idea of race is not a big deal in Asia. I know because I went there to talk to the people, talk to them about race. To them, they don't really understand why is race or someone's race or ethnicity a big deal. Class is a big deal over there. If you live in the city versus if you live in the, in the rural areas, that's a big deal for sure. But race, at least, and I mean, that's not completely true because there have definitely been African people who have been mistreated by um, Asian police. That was a whole thing last summer, right? But not to the extent to which we see it as an issue in the United States. So, when they get here, they're trying to understand, okay, where, where do I fit? Clearly I'm not white. We don't wanna treat it like the blacks. We don't wanna be treated like the blacks. We're not black, we're not white. We're Asian. Where are we gonna fall? in terms of treatment, in terms of opportunity. And so as they begin to assimilate into US culture, what white people started to realize was that, oh, Asian Americans aren't like the blacks, the Negro. They're not like Latinx people. These people are a different kind of minority. They are a model minority because the New York Times says, despite the fact that they deal with marginalization, but despite the fact that I, I imagine they deal with racism as well, they have achieved success. So the model minority myth says that, oh, Asian Americans are the model minority. Black people, if you want to know how to be successful in America, look at the model minority, which is the Asians. Latinx people, you want to know how to be successful, look at the Asians. Native Americans, you want to know how to be successful, look at the Asians. Look at how successful they are. Look at how much they are achieving success academically. They, they come over here and within a few months they have businesses, they have stores. They support each other. They come to school and not even knowing the language, they come to school, they study hard, they're smart. And now they're graduating at the top of the class, sometimes having greater graduation rates than the white people, than the white Americans. Look at that. Look how much America opens up and loves minorities. Because the Asians aren't complaining. They're not out here marching. They're not out here starting movements and this and that for it. They understand America is a blessing. It's a blessing to be here. And they come here and they work hard and they're not complaining. They follow the rules and look at them. Now they're successful. Now they're running companies. Now they have nice houses and nice cars and they, they're not pushing back. They're not trying to gain 
equal rights because they just work hard. And if you work hard, you're gonna get your equal rights. To all you other minorities, look at the look at the Asians. They're gonna, they're the ones you need to model yourselves after not trying to march and protest. That's the ultimately the idea of the model minority myth. Now keep in mind when the person did the study for this idea of the model minority, it was only a few Japanese immigrants that they studied, but they took this small study, made sure that the conclusions fit with their preconceived notions and ran with this idea of the model minority. Some people may say, well, that's unfair to have that idea because you can't just put all people in, in this one box. But number two, some people may say, well, even if it is a false stereotype, sounds like a good one. Sounds like they're saying that they're good. They're a good minority. Why would, it's, it's better than being stereotyped as a criminal or as stupid or as a thug or a gangster or a rapist. It's better than those stereotypes. These people are being stereotyped as smart and brilliant as following the rules. But there is something ha harmful about this model minority myth. It is absolutely harmful. Any stereotypes, any um, generalized ideas about people, whether it may seem positive or negative, is still harmful. It takes away the diversity within that group. These are some of the reasons why the myth of the model minority is harmful. Number one, it's racially divisive. You're dividing people based on race. Instead of looking at what the real problem is, which is the white supremacy and the white hatred in the country and the overall racism, people oftentimes look at, or what the model minority is saying, well, don't look at what these systems have done to keep different races at a disadvantage and promote white advantage. What you should be looking at is how well this minority group is doing and be like them. And so now you're pitting these different races against each other. The idea of this was to suggest that everybody can make it, that America was the land of opportunity, it was this land of meritocracy. But that's one reason why this minority myth, model minority myth is a problem because it's racially divisive. Number two, it's a myth, it's not true. Number three, it takes off, it absolves systems, that have been used to promote white advantage, it absolves oftentimes leaders that oftentimes are white from the responsibility of why these unequal governments, unequal policies, unequal actions exist and are legal. These are some of the reasons why the model minority is a myth and why it's harmful. Number four, it puts undue pressure on Asian Americans to achieve this level of success. So the model minority is an absolute myth. It's not true and it's harmful. some of the responses to the myth of the model minority. Most Asian Americans seem to accept white as mainstream, average, normal, and the frame of reference for higher social positions. Now, this is not me. This was written by Rosalind, uh, Rosalind Chow. And also this was written by the, um, by the author of uh, Model Minority in the textbook, Getting Real About Race.
So a lot of Asian Americans see white people as mainstream, as average. This is the standard that we have to look up to. And Rosalind Child did about 60 interviews with Asian Americans all over the country for the myth of the model minority and did some more for Asian American sexual politics. And in both of those books that were published came to a lot of these findings in addition to the people, uh, the authors of the one in, in your book. That many Asian Americans do fall victim to this idea of whiteness as normal, whiteness as right. And so many of them now, many of them respond to this myth, myth of the model minority by having three goals. If we're gonna come to this country, our goals are to do three things, own a home. Other goal, start a business and be our own boss. And then lastly, send our children to an Ivy League school. Those are oftentimes the, the main goals of many, not all, many Asian Americans who come to the United States. Another thing that um, authors have found, scholars have found about Asian American practices is that Asian Americans intermarry at a rate higher than any other minority group, particularly Asian American women. They are more likely to outmarry and when we say outmarry, what we're saying is marry outside of their racial group than any other minority group. In fact, I think I, last time I looked at the statistics, maybe a year or two years ago, the statistics said that Asian American women were more likely to marry outside of their racial group than any other demographic. Black women were less likely to marry outside of their racial group than any other demographic then right above them was black men. And white men, I think were more likely to marry inside their racial group than any other demographic. So these are just some of the rate of the interracial marriage statistics that I just, you know, sometimes I just kind of look at quantitative data just to see what it's talking about. U.S. born Asian Americans are less likely to want to assimilate. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that Asian Americans who are born in the United States are less likely to want to assimilate or believe that whiteness is the normal or believe that the main three goals are own our own, be your be own boss, send your child to an Ivy League school and marry outside your race. Why are US born Asian Amer Americans less likely to assimilate in these ways? Oftentimes because they recognize the disadvantages associated with being non-white, non-white more than their parents do. Oftentimes their parents came from the actual country that they were living in. And when you're living in another country, you don't see what goes on on the inside in the United States. So from the outside, it looks amazing. Place of freedom and democracy, people from all walks of life, eating, playing, working, having fun, fighting for their country. What an amazing, amazing place. You can criticize the president without Worrying if you're gonna lose your life? Wow, this is incredible. I need to go here. But then if you grow up in the United States, if you were born and raised here and you've gone through the school systems, you've lived in different neighborhoods, you've experienced certain things, then you're more likely to say, oh, It's not like it is on the brochure. The United States is complex. The United States has a dark history. There are things that go on in this country that a lot of people don't know about. And a lot of people don't want a lot of people to know about. If you're born in America, 
no matter your racial background, you're more likely to understand the complexities of race, the inequality of race, more so than your parents, especially if you come from another country. Because growing up here, that is when you start to see it and it makes, starts to make sense. So I want you to, now we're gonna go a little bit more into this idea of the model minority and some of the things that Asian Americans do deal with from, from a male perspective and also from a woman's perspective. So go ahead and click on this link, really quick video, and then we're gonna go to uh, the next slide. All right, so as you can see, um, people have these images around particularly Asian American men. And this is something that Child talks about in the reading, right? Um, how this notion of the model minority myth and race and racism affects particularly Asian American men. And then we'll go into Asian American women in a second. Before we get into that though, we need to have a conversation about what is masculinity period. So as we're on this next slide, I want you to think about what is masculinity in America or what are the characteristics of manliness in America? When you think about what it means to be a man, how people uh, characterize men. What are some things that you think about? Somebody says, describe a man. What is a man to you? You might say a man is strong. You might say a man is tall or big. Even if he's not tall, big in some way, muscles. You might say a man doesn't show emotion. Men don't cry. A man has money. He's financially stable. He can take care of his family. If he doesn't have money, he can get money. A man is a protector. A man is a provider. How do people show masculinity and manliness? Sometimes it's through violence. You want to be with somebody who can be violent if they need to in order to protect you. Another example of manliness, some people may say a beard. Nowadays, we're in this, you know, there was a time where beards weren't cool. Now they're cool. So if a man has a beard that Sometimes it's looked at as being masculine. Athletics, you can run, you can jump, you can play baseball, soccer, football, basketball. Muscles. All of these are characteristics of manliness, ways in which masculinity is measured in the United States. So with that being said, let's look at this next slide. These two gentlemen, do y'all know who these two gentlemen are? One is named William Hung and the other one is named Psy, P-S-Y, I believe. First one, he was a finalist, or no, I don't know if he was a finalist, but he got popular on American Idol. His audition was very funny and people laughed. And then he got a record deal. So. Psy, uh, at one point, I don't know if it still exists, but he had the most viewed video on YouTube. He was the creator of Gundam Style. And Gundam Style was this uh, dance 
craze that hit the airwaves and it's caught on. Now, looking at these two gentlemen, would a person, would you use a lot of those characteristics that we use to describe manliness? Would you use that to describe these gentlemen? Do they look big and strong and dangerous and violent and protectors and providers? They might be providers and they have money. The Gundam style gentlemen, you probably have a lot of money from that video and songs and downloads and ringtones. William Hung may have money from his record deal. But when we think about manliness, would these gentlemen come to mind? Masculinity, would these gentlemen come to mind? Probably not. You may think of somebody else like The Rock, Channing Tatum, Denzel Washington, or whoever, LeBron James. People are considered manly, people who give off masculinity, traditional masculinity. And so with that, we discuss what we call Asian American male constructions, which are ways in which masculinity is constructed in our society. And the ways in which Asian American males are constructed are oftentimes at, at a disadvantage or in, in uh, is the complete opposite to the way in which masculinity is constructed. Masculinity is seen as strong. Asian Americans, males are constructed as weak, physically weak in the, in the media. Asian uh, men, masculine men, when they come into a place, you're supposed to think twice before you run up. You're supposed to think twice before you think about hitting them. Or you think about saying something that's disrespectful. <clears throat> the Asian American males are oftentimes constructed as non-threatening. Oh, he's not gonna do anything. He's a whip. He's a squeak. <laughs> We're in the 1960s and 70s pit squeak or whatever. He's a whim, he's a punk, he's a this, he's a that. Men are, have this masculine vibe. But Asian American males are often constructed as feminized. Soft. Can't fight. Can't defend themselves. Again, what we're talking about in popular culture and media can't defend themselves, smaller than stature. So these are the ways in which Asian American men are constructed in US society. Now, if we go to the next slide, we see that there are some examples of Asian American men that break this mold that function outside of the stereotypical constructions. Who are these two gentlemen? If you don't know, the gentleman who has the China shirt on, his name is Yao Ming. Some people may say one of the better centers to ever play in the NBA. In fact, I think it was in Shaq's, Shaquille O'Neal's uh, Hall of Fame speech, he said the player that gave him the most problem was Yao Ming, because he would not back down. He was very tall, he was very strong. And he would not back down to Shaquille O'Neal. He said he really had to work hard against him. This other gentleman is Jeremy Lin. He played for the 
for the New York Knicks for a while. G- really good. I wouldn't say great, but he was a good ball player. How do they break the mold of this Asian American male construction that we were just talking about? <clears throat> well, number one, they play in the NBA. And in order for you to play in the NBA, people who are people who play in the NBA are oftentimes these very masculine people because they're very athletic, they're strong. Tall, even the guys that aren't that tall are tall compared to the average person like Steph Curry. I think he's still six foot, maybe six foot one, so still pretty tall. He may not be Yao Ming tall, but still tall. But athletic, strong, can run, can jump. People who play in the NBA can often dunk a basketball. They can entertain. They make a lot of money. These are things that are fall inside the construction of masculinity, American masculinity. So an Asian American who's able to do these things are seen as breaking the mold of the Asian American male construction. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of examples of this in the media. We have more examples of the size or the William Holmes, especially when we look at TV shows in Hollywood. And we don't have very diverse expressions of Asian American male masculinity. And these can have some psychological effects for women and men. For women, oftentimes Asian American women question their interracial relationships because of what is called Asia field. We talked about this before. Sometimes it's called yellow fever. Men who only want to date Asian American women because they're seen as these sex objects, these geishas. They're seen as people that they can easily sleep with and experience. I want to experience an Asian woman before I settle down. And Asian American women aren't the only ones that have to deal with that. All women of all races have to deal with that. They don't, many times they don't want to be seen as something they can experience or somebody experiences them before they settle down. Asian American men question their interests. because of these effects of racism. Also, when we go to the myth of the model minority, we see that there are these negative consequences of people seeing Asian Americans as these model minorities, as the people that everybody should look to. Because number one, it makes them seem passive. Look at them, they just have their head down, they do what they're supposed to do, and then now they're on top. As if they don't have feelings, as if they don't feel race and racism, as if they don't get angry, as if they don't have a right to protest, as if they don't have a right to demand equality. So oftentimes Asian Americans get alienated and isolated from white people because of racism, but then sometimes they may get alienated from other racial groups because They are seen as the model. So they say, well, you don't know our struggle because we are the ones that I hated the most. It's almost like if you had siblings. How many of you have siblings? If your parents, and maybe this has happened to you, so if this has, then you know how it feels. If it hasn't, imagine that your mother and or father, or father and or mother, or guardian comes to you and says, you know what, you should be more like, insert brother name here, insert sister name here. How is that gonna gonna make you feel? You'll probably feel like 
Am I not good enough? Is who I am not valid? Valid? That's not fair. So that's one thing. Then it may cause a rift between you and your sibling. Well, clearly, mom likes you more. Clearly, dad likes you more. And they like me. And it's not the sibling's fault that the parents say that. They may love you. But now you're looking at them like, mm -mm. they like you more. I don't like you. To the sibling that they say, I feel like, or you need to be more like your sibling to that sibling. He or she may be saying, I don't feel that way. And now they're being alienated from you for something that they don't even believe. Also, now they have this overwhelming expectation to achieve. Oh, I guess I'm the golden child. That means I got to get all A's and I got to make sure I make the, the, the football team and the soccer team and the cheerleading squad and make sure I go to church or I go to my place of worship and make sure I have my community service hours and make sure I get into a good school, make sure I graduate, make sure I go to grad school or law school or med school or whatever, make sure I do right. Now they have this pressure. Also racism that occurs to Asians, sometimes it's seen as less important. Asian people go through racism, eh. They're the model minority. Nobody cares. They're not going through things Black people going through or Latinx people going through. Black immigrants literally getting whipped at the border. Latinx people are getting turned around, forced to go back to their country, arrested. Black folks getting killed in the streets by law enforcement, unarmed. These things are happening to them, so it's less important. Sometimes this may happen because of this model minority myth. Oftentimes, Asian Americans are subject to harassment and bullying. They might miss out on opportunities. Also, they experience higher rates of stress because of these issues. So this model minority myth is not something that should be perpetuated. It's not like it's a good thing. It actually has these very negative consequences. Also, while Asian American men have these negative views of being less masculine, sometimes they are subject to the stereotypes that are hyper masculine. So either they're seen as too weak or they're seen as terrorists, i.e., the Virginia Tech shooter i.e. Saddam Hussein, Osama bin Laden, anybody from those areas of the world, India, Saudi Arabia, Afghanistan, Iraq, anybody from those areas are seen as what? Terrorists. So it's either they're too weak, or they're out and out terrorists and killers. And people love to talk about the violence that is enacted by Asian countries or in the United States, but don't say much about the violence by the United States on those countries. If we're gonna tell the story, we need to tell the whole thing. Not to say that any type of terrorism towards America is okay, because it's not in any country should have the right to defend themselves if they are terrorized. Any country, including the United States. But also, if ever the United States terrorizes another country, which they have, that country also has the right to defend itself. And so when we tell these stories, we have to tell the whole story. And it is important that we do that so that at the very least, even if we're not historians or 
people who study foreign policy, at least it can cause us to lessen the general, generalized stereotypes that we have about people. Oftentimes, African-American men, sorry, Asian-American men, when it comes to sexuality, the way in which they are shown and displayed in the media, there's a little difference between the image of the gay and the straight Asian-American male. So you see that they're very feminized. Oftentimes, when you see a white male, a white gay male and a white straight male, very, it's a clear difference. The white straight male is cool, and you have a beard, hair, beautiful, well shampooed hair, strong, muscular, good job, saving the day. The good old American boy. The gay white male oftentimes has these displays, some people say, of a black woman, sassy and fancy and shaking of the head, et cetera, et cetera going overboard, right, essentially, um, being very um, exaggerated with this performance of homosexuality. And that is not how all homosexuals act. Same thing with the black gay, gay male and the black straight male. Exact same thing. Black straight men usually have a different expression in the media. Though oftentimes black men in general are seen as hypersexualized or these criminals or whatever, but at least there is this difference between the black gay male and the black straight male. This is the argument that Chow was making. Same thing with Latinx, Latino men and Latino, gay Latino men and straight Latino men in the way in which they're seen in the media. But with Asian American men, they seem to be feminized across the board. So you can tell no very little difference. Either that or they're desexualized altogether. So the handsome white guy in the movie gets the girl at the end. The handsome black guy gets the girl at the end. The handsome Latino man gets the girl at the end. But the Asian American man doesn't get the girl at the end. They're seen as being desexualized. How many of you have ever seen the movie Romeo Must Die? It's a movie with, well, I, some of you might not have been born, but if you were, you're probably babies, newborns. I think it came out in like 2002, 2001, 2002, something like that. Um, it was a movie with DMX, who recently passed away. He was a rapper, an actor, um, who recently passed away. Um, Aaliyah, who also passed away, um, she was a singer, an R&B singer, a very beautiful woman, um, and Jet Li, an Asian man. And it's a movie, they have to save Aaliyah from these guys who want to kidnap her, stuff like that. So Jet Li and DMX work together to fight off the people and save the day. And when they wrote the script, the person who's doing the most fighting is Jet Li because he knows all of the, um, I don't know exactly what style of fighting it is. It might be Kung Fu, it might be karate. But he's doing most of the fighting. So at the end of the movie, he's supposed to get the girl, he's supposed to kiss her at the end. But then when they get ready to shoot the movie, Hollywood says, no, no, we need to change that. I say, well, why? Reason why is because they say that's not real life. A beautiful woman like Aaliyah is not gonna date Jet Li, even if he is the strong guy that beat everybody up to save her. So he, he she's gonna go away with BMX. That makes more sense. The beautiful black, woman goes away with the, with the handsome, strong black man. And that's how it was. So it is the desexualization of the Asian American man that Rosalind Child says is a problem with these Asian American male constructions. 
And this uh, these uh, constructions and these uh, ways in which these images are displayed in media and Hollywood, it, it doesn't just affect men, it affects women as well. Particularly around the notion of beauty. In fact, beauty is an issue all the way around women of all racial groups, because beauty is a social construct. And what do we mean when we say beauty is a social construct? What we're saying is that beauty is based on the society in which you live and the time in which you live and, and the time in which you exist. What is considered beautiful now wasn't, may not have been considered beautiful 30 years ago or 50 years ago or 100 years ago. Beauty changes. So beauty is a social construct. And then what is considered beautiful in one country or in one society may not be considered beautiful in another country or in another society. So beauty is a social construct. It's hegemonic in that, and when we say hegemonic, we mean that the social, cultural, and ideological um, influences are exerted by the dominant group whether we're talking about racial hegemony, whites, gender hegemony, men, sexual hegemony, heterosexuals, the hegemonic group, the dominant group exerts their social, cultural, or ideolo ideological ideas. Since this is a race and ethnic relations class, we're talking about white people and white ideas and white culture. And so essentially because of that, white women are the standard of beauty. If you were to Google beautiful images or whatever, oftentimes, sometimes you will see more white women or if you don't see white women, if you do see women of color, you see women of color with white beauty standards. Long hair, lighter skin, thinner noses, slim bodies. So white women and the beauty standards that oftentimes are associated with white women are the hegemonic ideas and influences exerted by the dominant group on everybody. Even most times, white women don't even meet those standards. Many times they try. Force feeding, practicing or being bulimic trying to maintain certain standards of beauty that can eventually be harmful to them. So beauty is a social construct and it affects women, but particularly Asian women. Next slide, to the point where some of them practice colorism or are subject or victims to colorism. Colorism, what is colorism? It's when people within the same racial group identify a certain shade as being dominant or superior or better than another shade, particularly the lighter shade being seen as, as better, prettier, dominant, superior, smarter than the lighter shade. Examples of this can be found in dating back to slavery in African-American communities where the darker so-called slave would be in the field and the lighter so-called slave would be in the house, causing, some people say it caused friction between the so-called slaves. Massa loves you better because you're a lighter skin, you're in the house, or you are mixed race because you are a product of whiteness, white people, oftentimes through rape. And so it was this colorism that did and sometimes still exists in the black community. But it's not just in the black community, it's also in Asian communities as well. I remember when I visited China some years ago and I was excited. 
I'd never been to anywhere in Asia. But now I'm a sociologist, I'm going here for research and I get off the plane and I'm walking and because I know what to look for and I see things that I probably would not have seen because my sociological imagination has been activated. I see things in a way that some people don't and immediately I begin to look at all of the images in the airport. Beautiful Chinese women. But they were all very, 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 very light, almost white. And I said, huh, is, do the Chinese people look like this? Are they this light? But I quickly found out after I left the airport and started to walk around Beijing and it's like, no, they, they're not that light. Why do you think those were the images on the airport? Why? Because that is, that is seen as the standard of beauty, the standard of purity. That is because that's what people believe, people want to see, white people and others who are, who are subject to colorism and prefer lighter skin. Definitely evident in, in, in Indian society to the point where coloring your skin, skin bleaching treatment is a multi-billion dollar industry in India. And in certain parts of Africa, bleaching your skin so that it gets really, really, really light. And this was influenced a lot because of British colonization. British colonization made a lot of Indians feel as though their color was not sufficient or beautiful. So even when they got their independence, many of their minds were still brainwashed. If you're in my sociological theory class, we talked about decolonization this week. And that was one of the things we talked about, how to decolonize the mind. Just because you're phys politically decolonized does not necessarily mean your mental is decolonized. And so losing these ideas, the teachings, the behaviors, the practices, the ideas of the colonizer, one being that their race, their shade, their beauty standards are the best or are superior to your culture or your race or your shade or your beauty standards. So colorism is a big example of that. Next slide. And Chow talks about counter narratives. She says something interesting, she says, now, this is something that has existed in communities of color all over. It's not just Asians, Indians, Latinx, Black people have dealt with colorism. But she said, but why is it that this skin bleaching is not as common in African-Americans for some reason? Even among Africans, it may be common. Even among Caribbeans, it may be common. But how come for African-Americans it's not as common? How come African-Americans don't practice the skin bleaching? For a while they, they did perms, but then now perms, then not to say perm, perms aren't bad, perms aren't good or bad, but now you find more African-American women who are finding ways to work with their natural hair. So why is this the case, child asks. And she dates it back, she says, maybe it was because during the 1960s and 1970s, there was this counter narrative that was created by black people called the Black is Beautiful movement during the black power era. And it was this movement that became very popular in movies and TV and radio and music and art and began to permeate all the different areas of social life, sports, entertainment, news, academia. 
this Black is Beautiful movement was a counter narrative that Black people created to say, we are going to push back against what you taught us about ourselves. We are not going to believe that our hair is because it's nappy or it's curly, that it's not good, or that it's not healthy, or that it's not proper. We're not gonna believe that about our skin or about whatever, that's about our, our culture. And so this counter narrative became very popular. So now, this is something that, not to say black people still don't deal with colorism, because we do. But skin bleaching and certain things like that are not as big of an issue because of this very popular counter narrative in the 1960s and 70s that have now just been a part of black culture. The natural hair movement, same thing. I was in college when that became, when that got real big. It's natural hair movement. And now, again, something very common in the black community. And she argues that Asian Americans should probably adopt this same strategy. Start a counter narrative, make that counter narrative popular like African Americans did. And maybe in doing that, it will be then a part of our culture to automatically deny and denounce these colonized ways of thinking that lightness is better or straight hair is better or European beauty standards are better and expand our idea of beauty standards to say all beauty is better, all beauty is good. Everybody is beautiful. And one culture or one race or one style does not have to be better than another. So coming to the end, Asian Americans are saying, I am not your model minority. I will not be used as a stereotype, but we can look at our cultural differences and use them as themes to understand how to get to know one another. And we can engage with each other. Next slide, last slide. And we can engage with each other. Some strategies might be diversity clubs, panel discussions, Asian heritage days, mentors, volunteerism, partnerships with other campus departments and colleges, finding ways in which we can have open and honest dialogue around race so that we can then support one another, listen to one another, and not use one group to make another group feel bad when we all have to rid ourselves of the effects of race and racism and the um, traditions and ideas around race and racism in this country. And when we can do that, we can help to create a better today, not a better tomorrow, but a better today for our children, for our nieces, our nephews, the young people, et cetera. So that is the end of that lecture. Um, do not forget you have a, an exam this Friday. So I hope that you are prepared. Um, with that being said, have a great week, have a great weekend. If you have questions about the exam, feel free to reach out to me during office hours or you can email or inbox me and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions you may have. And with that being said, I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful weekend weekend.